Math Mass Appeal, a podcast that brings modern Satanism to the masses. Yay! Hey, we're here! <laughs> Hello! <laughs> Which, as of today, we have been doing for 100 episodes now. Woo! And in honor of the occasion, for the first time ever on Black Mass Appeal, we'll be doing a Black Mass just for you, our unfaithful listeners. Now, if you're listening to this on one of your favorite podcast services, just know that you could always head over to the Black Mass Appeal YouTube to see the video version. And if you're already watching us on YouTube, when we're done, you could check out the audio version of the program for the rest of our 100th episode's festivities, in which we'll crown our all-time BMA favorite devils. Joining me today, I've got Daniel. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm a member of the Satanic Temple, and I'm an organizer for Satanic Bay Area. And uh, unless law enforcement has seized this footage, in which case, I don't even know any of y'all. And also joining me is is this person that we don't know. Hi, it's it's me, it's Tabitha. <laughs> I'm an administrator for Satanic Bay Area, and my hair is so sharp that I could cut you like a knife. That's why I'm standing over here. And of course, my name is Simone. I'm an administrator for Satanic Bay Area. And I never think of what to say ahead of time, so let's just move on. You know, you take care of everything else on the show, so it's okay to let this one thing slide. <laughs> you always have funny ones. And we are here today in our lovely and discreet Oakland ritual space. The fear of devilish rites and subversive masses is actually older than Satanism itself. In his 1967 occult primer, The Black Arts, British historian Richard Cavendish wrote, as early as the second century, saints accused Gnostic teachers of perversions to the mass to worship a deity other than the Christian God. As modern Satanists, we know that perversions to the sacred mass are part of our legal and human rights, and that everything that's sacred in one religion is blasphemy in another. Without the right to be blasphemous, we wouldn't have religious freedom at all. But in spite of what furious fundies tell you, there's more to satanic ritualizing than just sticking it to another religion. In the ritual setting, we celebrate ourselves and each other and the liberating freedom of expression and community we discover when we come together at times like this to say, Hail Satan. Hail, Hail Satan. Satan. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tabitha and Daniel to take you through the rest of our ritual. Oh, we're not just standing here? Ah, oh, dang. I'm totally I mean, totally you are nervous. eye candy, <laughs> but you also <laughs> serve a purpose. Thank you very much. Oh, she's gone. Oh, jeez. Movie magic, ladies and gentlemen. Where'd she go? I know. So it's the power of digital editing. It's okay. <laughs> Before we begin, I thought it would be appropriate if we anointed our Baphomet with a little oil. This is Hexanot oil, by the way. Friend of the show. They did not pay for this endorsement. And with that taken care of, Tabitha is going to lead us through the Dark Lord's Prayer. Those of you listening and watching at home, feel free to repeat after us. Tabitha, whenever you're ready. All right. Our Father who art in hell. Our Father who art in hell. Unhallowed be thy name. Unhallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom is come, thy will is done. Thy kingdom is come, thy will is done. On earth as it is below. On earth as it is below. We take this night our rightful due. We take, we take this, this night our rightful due. due. And trespass on faithless taboos. And, and trespass on faithless taboos. taboos. Lead us into temptation. Lead us into temptation. And deliver us from false piety. And deliver us from false piety. For ours is the world. For, For ours is the, the world. world. The riches, the riches, and the glory, and the glory, forever and ever, forever and ever. Hail Satan! Hail, Hail Satan. Satan! Before we move into our main invocation here, by the way, our, our lines are down here. I'm just going to be straight with the people. That's. But let's let's let's. It's the 100th episode. We owe people. We owe people a little honesty. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Nevertheless, we're going to move into our main invocation now and. You know, the topic I think is going to be a little bit topical, but a little timeless. We're talking about science. Now, if you open up a Bible and turn to... Do we have a Bible? Yes, hold on. Ooh, okay. Oh. Oh. Well, we had a Bible. It's for the best. 
If you open up a Bible and you turn to 2 Kings, you can read about all when the king of Judah was sick. He sent messengers to talk to the priests of Beelzebub. And when Elijah, the absolute worst prophet, hears about this, he gets angry and he admonishes them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you go to ask after Beelzebub? Well, context clues tell us that he is asking that rhetorically, but as it turns out, there is an answer. No. Oh. No, there is not a God in Israel. That's not a political statement, it just turns out there are no gods anywhere. Unless we want to count Tom Waits. Hail Tom. Hail Tom. Now, what they do have in Israel instead is doctors and vaccines, which are both better to consult if you happen to be sick, whether you're a god or a prophet or anybody else. Better yet, consult them before you get sick. When Israel started vaccinating its population in December of 2020, they had over 8,000 new cases of COVID-19 per day. By the end of April, when they had vaccinated 54% of the population, that number dropped down to less than 150. Now what I find interesting about this is that Beelzebub was probably a plague god. Which me and, and, and of course, if you know your medical science, you know that the most basic building block of a vaccine is actually the virus and the disease itself. Which means, from a certain point of view, mm -hmm. these findings confirm that the god of Elijah did not cure Israel, but Beelzebub did. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. In the classic American play, Inherit the Wind, hard-nosed atheist lawyer Henry Drummond can, comes to a small American town to defend the teachings of Darwin's theory of evolution by natural science in public school. And when he steps off the train, a child takes one look at him and cries, The devil! Oh! <laughs> Fear of satanic plots behind new discoveries continues to motivate technophobes around the globe. Excepting those who are flat earthers, of course. Oh, of course. Historian Robert Fuller's 1995 book, Naming the Antichrist, enumerates religious fears of such diverse innovations as fiber optics, supermarket barcodes, television, computers, and microchips. All of them supposedly means through which Satan may enslave humanity. During the 20th century, fundies fretted that the Beast of Revelation would turn out to be a giant supercomputer, and that the dreaded Mark of the Beast would be an implanted microchip tracking or controlling your every move. Beep boop. Today's internet boils over with frantic conspiracist claims of quantum computers and the Large Hadron Collider. Large Hardon Collider. Hee <laughs> hee. Sorry, this is serious. Are being used to summon demons. When Oxford University used 3D printing to replicate ancient Roman ruins destroyed by ISIS, Fundies claimed this too was a demonic portal and accused the Institute of Raising Evil Spirits to attack Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh? Don't ask. I won't. Now, uh, Ben Carson, a dotty retired surgeon who was for some reason the head of HUD under Trump, said that he believed that Darwin had learned the theory of evolution from Satan. And as a matter of fact, Roger Murnau, an ex-Satanist conspiracy asshole, did him one better by claiming that Satan himself came up from hell to teach natural selection and evolution to Darwin. Both Darwin and Satan were in the Illuminati together, you see, so it was, oh. it was easy for them to network. Remarking on poor Galileo's failed bid to convince the church that the earth revolves around the sun, malcontent 19th century preacher Moses Hall said, quote, the devil, Galileo, and science were right. The church was wrong, as usual. Fuck, shots fired, man. Wait, is, is he agreeing with us? This guy was a preacher. Okay. Man, Moses, go tell on the mountain, yes. <laughs> to be clear though, we do not define scientific inquiry as satanic just because a few cracked nuts say so. Rather, we think that Satan as a character has encouraged human ambition and the accumulation of knowledge going all the way back to that old forbidden fruit fable. 
In Lord Byron's play Cain, A Mystery, Cain learns the wonders of cosmology from Satan and is amazed to see how small the Earth looks compared to the rest of the cosmos. And Satan confirms, yes, that the Earth and the Moon are just some of the innumerable stars that canvas the universe. And Satan asks, if there should be worlds greater than thine own, inhabited by greater things, and they themselves be more in number than thy dull earth, what wouldst thou think? This suggestion recalls the unfortunate Giovanni Bruno, an Italian friar burned by the Roman Catholic Church in 1600 for heresy. His crime? Proposing that the stars may be distant suns, and that these suns may have planets of their own. For this notion, his partners in faith put him on the stake. But Cain says he would be proud of thought which knew such things. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. In Anatoly France's book, The Revolt of the Angels, when Arcade... Arcade? Arcade. Arcade, the most zealous of all the fallen angels, goes over to Satan's side. He declares that it is science that has inspired him with generous desire for freedom. Science, the newly fallen angel says, will even free heaven from God's tyranny. To be honest though, probably our favorite variation on the theme of Satan as patron of scientific inquiry is the short play, The Real Story of the Garden of Eden, written by Bay Area Satanist Jane Thomas and performed at our 2019 Halloween Black Mass and Benefit Show. Hail Jane. Hail Jane. In this satanic Halloween pageant, when Eve bites into the forbidden fruit, she's staggered and immediately declares, the scientific method is a system by which truth claims can be confirmed or denied by testing. Anything can be science if you challenge yourself. And as soon as Adam eats the fruit, he sits up straighter and informs the audience that he suddenly realized a fetus is not a human being. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. The Gospels preach, Blessed are they who have not seen, but still believe. But what is there to believe if you don't have any evidence for it? Why should we be asked to believe anything without corroboration? And why should our religious leaders ask us to accept anything that is not demonstrated? The ancient Christian writer Tertullian complained that philosophers and heretics ask all the same questions, and that questions are what make people into unbelievers. And thus, science becomes the fittest practice for the devil, along with the arts, music, theater, literature, and anything else that encourages the most base of all sins, critical thinking. Centuries of expecting science to give way to faith have rendered us with such Wonderful modern innovations as abstinence-only sex education, firebombed abortion clinics, and the fascinatingly American phenomena of an unmasked target shopper yelling in the faces of long-suffering retail employees, informing them that it's that person's sacred right to spread the plague all through their store. We think that it's about time that religion start conforming to what science tells us rather than the other way around. And that is why we are proponents of modern Satanism, this being possibly the first religion in the world that can make accommodation for scientific discovery without recourse to bullshit. Satan can heal the sick, feed the masses, turn lead into gold, and even raise the dead if doctors act fast enough. His tools for this are not miracles, but reason, logic, experiment, and the empirical process. And the deliverers of these wonders are not saints or angels, they're all of us. In Genesis, humans resolve to use their ingenuity to build a tower to the heavens, and God strikes it down because he's afraid that if they succeed, nothing will be restrained from them. Today, we've rebuilt the tower, and no divine being has the power to smite it. The only question is whether we want to continue sitting on the ground floor or whether we, like Lucifer, should resolve. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And, picking ourselves up, see just how far our ambitions will collectively take us. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. There, I think that went all right, don't you? Yeah. Now we're going to interrupt this ritual very briefly for a history lesson, and the purpose of that lesson is to explain 
The next step that we're going to do is what we like to call the desecration of the host. Tabitha? In the year 1247 in Germany, city records remember that an unidentified Jewish man was put to death by burning. The charge? He was accused of profaning and destroying the consecrated host. The earliest recorded instance of so-called host desecrations. Thereafter considered one of the most reviled and dangerous of all mortal sins. And two centuries to come, superstitious people spread rumors that Satanists were gathering for the purposes of profaning the host. In fact, in many sources, this was considered the very definition of a black mass. Thank you. Backwards reverence for the supposedly magical and supernatural significance of the host led governments to enact cruel and draconian punishments when they believed that anybody had abused it. However, we hold that an attack on the alleged body of a god is the very definition of a victimless crime. So for the sake of all those people unjustly persecuted and prosecuted over a crime that is actually impossible to commit, I am going to be presenting us with a kind of host of our own, which we're going to treat with all the reverence and respect that we feel is due. Would you like to go first? Oh, here, actually here. Yes. Help yourself. Terrible. <laughs> They're better than the real ones, though. Mm. Ladylike. May I? Please. That's just. That's not the blood of Christ. That's just regular blood. Just, just bloody blood. And now this is a biohazard. Now. That wasn't too bad, I don't think, but it is worth noting that in a lot of historical contexts, that would have gotten us at the very least arrested, possibly prosecuted, and in some places executed. But I think, in the modern context in which we live, the only thing we can say about it is it was pretty good television. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. I feel good about that. I mean, I could use a drink. <laughs> uh, would you care no, for... No, 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 no. All right, well... <laughs> Don't, don't feed me the Q line <laughs> if you're not willing to follow it. I would rather drink wax. <laughs> Anybody who's never attended our in-person rituals wonders if this is what it's like in this action. Yeah, it's exactly pretty much like this, like this yeah. <laughs> and now, I think... That means our time is drawing to an end. But we do have one last rite that we're going to enact, and for that, actually, we're going to invite Simone back up here by way of another miraculous digital edit. And finally, we like to close out ceremonies like this with a ritual gesture we call the Mark of the Beast. As a gesture of affirmation and personal recognition, we invite each participant up to the altar and place just a little bit of blood on their foreheads to mark the occasion. Now, this is real blood, but it's not human blood, so we don't have to worry about pathogens because, after all, uh, we are here to respect science. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Or should we give it to the audience? <laughs> oh, coming around. Here you go. Do it to Jesse. Here you go, Jesse. <laughs> Now, when the last mark is applied, we thank everyone for coming, extinguish the candles, and say, one last time, Hail Satan. Hail, Hail Satan. Satan. Now remember, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can always go to the full audio version to hear our entire show, including our favorite BMA Satans. And finally, thank you to everyone who helped make this sinful centennial possible. Mm -hmm.